All right, guys. Hey, welcome back to another week of work in progress. It feels like it's been a really long time since I've seen you guys, although, you know, we met up last week. But yeah, I'm excited to dive into John once more. We're going to be finishing up John chapter 11, and then we see how far we can make it in John chapter 12. So as usual, before we start, can I have two volunteers, please? Someone, I mean, it's not a lot of us, so someone to sing and someone to pray. If anything, I'll pray, but to ask me for two volunteers. I'll sing. Thank you, Vicky. Anybody want to pray or should I go ahead? I can pray. All right. Thanks, Brandon. All right. Take it away, Vicky. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn in pieces. It's my offering. Please take me to the cross. Leave me there alone to gaze upon your glory and sing to you the song. But take me to the King. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father God in heaven, we bless your name and give you thanks for being a faithful friend. God, we give you thanks for this space in which you can meditate on your word and give thanks for the amazing things you've done in our life. And so even right now, God, I ask that you send your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, that you open our hearts and minds to receive the beautiful truths of your word, and that you hasten the footsteps of those who haven't come yet. And I pray, God, that for someone who's going through something, someone who's hurting, someone who needs a word, that tonight you'll provide that word for that person. God, we bless your name in advance for the mighty things that you'll do and the mighty things you'll reveal to us. Thank you, Father God. We bless your name. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Vicky and Brandon. All right, so anybody remember what happened so far in John 11? Just a quick recap. Come on, class. So Jesus got the news that Lazarus died, right? Yeah. And then he waited four days before he went. Yeah. Hello. Guys, you know, so I'm not the funny bugger talking. I love a conversation. Yes, Brandon, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so in as few words as possible, um, mm -hmm. Jesus used a difficult situation for God's glory and for the good of others. And that difficult situation and her sad experience was the death of his friend, Lazarus. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so we had stopped at verse 44 last week, but I just want to like take a step back and uh, read uh, verses 41 to 44, and then I'll tell you what was revealed to me this week. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. I don't think we got all the way to 44. We stopped at our own, mm -hmm. like, 33, around there. Ah. Okay, Joshua <laughs> had told me 44, so I was just going with that. All right. We had a record, right? Yeah. Mm, let me see. Like 32, 33 around there is where we stopped commenting on. All right, so we can just pick up at 30 then. All right, so I will read from verses 30 to 37. And then, yeah, we discuss. All right. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had, not, if you had been here, my brother would have not died when jesus therefore saw her weeping 
and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And so the Jews were saying, Behold, how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man also from dying? All right. Just going to pause right there. What do you guys think? Any comments, any questions here? Um, I've heard... Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. No, continue. I'll, I'll speak after you make a point. All right. Um, I was saying that I've heard two viewpoints about the verse Jesus wept. I've heard the part, the hand where people think he was just overcome by emotions and you know, seeing that everyone crying around him and seeing that you know, Lazarus was his friend. And I've also heard the viewpoint that he was somewhat disappointed, I guess, that even though he turned up, people still doubted that he could raise Lazarus to back to life. What do you guys think? Yeah, Brandon. I think those two things can be true, but then a third perspective that I'd throw in there isn't necessarily mm -hmm. disappointment, but the we we've read in previous chapters in John that Jesus is able to, to see the hearts of those around him. You know, there mm -hmm. I think it was I don't remember if it was five or four where Jesus was in the temple and he was able to discern the motives behind the people despite their appearance of um the, or the impression that their questions posed. Um and even that Jesus had the capacity to do that, I I can't imagine how sad it must have made him feel, number one, that despite everything he'd done up to that point in time, people would still be disbelieving. But yeah. even after performing this miracle of raising somebody from the dead, they'd still be unbelieving. And the, the language of the people that speak here in John chapter 9, I think is so similar to the language at the cross, the same set of people who say, um, you know, if he really is such and such person, where is it in John chapter nine? If you really are, not nine, sorry, 11. If he mm -hmm. was really such man, then he'd be able to, you know, prevent Lazarus from dying. I see in that language, the same perspectives at the cross where it's like, is this man really the king of the Jews? If he is, then he can take mm -hmm. himself off the cross and all of that. And I'm just like, in the face of all that Jesus did and all that he represented, the powerful truths that he revealed, I can't imagine how much it must have broken his heart to see people who he really loved, as antagonistic as the Pharisees were and, you know, many of the Jews were. Jesus really loved these people. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine it must have hurt his heart as well. Outside of the very real fact that his friend died, it must have also hurt him to see the people who he came to love and to save reject him, you know? Yeah. I totally agree with that, Brandon. You had another point, though? I did. Um, I remember it? I don't remember it, though. I don't know if someone has to speak first. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? If not, um, there are some things we can look at from these verses that God sees our tears and that he's touched by our tears, that he also remembers our tears and he acts to dry our tears. There's something so comforting in knowing that he sees every tear that falls and he's acting to dry our tears. It's just so beautiful to see the love of God like that, you know? Yeah. Anybody else?
And that's also like, sorry, I'm gonna raise my hand. I'm gonna use this word. That's actually like really comforting, to be honest, because sometimes you're just so frustrated that you can't, you can't even talk. Like all you can mm-hmm. do is cry. I you know say your cries. Jesus, God is still gonna hear your cries, even if you can't. If you, if you can't voice what you want for voice, but you just know, say, Jesus, hear you and understand, you know? Yeah. So there's yeah. just a lot of comfort in that. Yeah. That reminds me of, I want to tell the exact verse, of how the Holy Spirit um, intercedes on our behalf with deep groanings, you know, too deep for words, as well as jesus himself like when we don't have the voice when we don't have the words the holy spirit and jesus is there for us yeah i really love that right anybody else i don't remember your point i think i had just combined two of them because i can't remember so i think i said it in the first point oh all right no problem hey anything else guys or can continue yeah, Brandon. Yeah, okay. Another point that came to mind. In verse 37, it says mm-hmm. that, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? And I find it interesting that um, this is said in the way that it is. Because when we flip back a few chapters to when Jesus healed the blind man, there were doubters then, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, I'm almost like, imagine it like a step by stepwise progression of jesus's miracles he does one thing and they doubt him and they come back again this time at the the resurrection of lazarus recognizing that he has a capacity to heal the blind but then still introducing to that their very clear doubt and rejection of the savior how is it on one hand that you can recognize that this man heals the blind but then still reject him and what he has a capacity to be and do it's Mm. i can't imagine it any other way as a purposeful and intentional choice to -hmm. resist the voice of the holy spirit Mm -hmm. because it's not like you know it's god jesus is even asking these people to simply have blind faith he's presented towards them the evidence of who he is and they recognize that but it's still choose to refuse what their eyes have seen for themselves it's it's crazy mm-hmm. in my mind man baffling makes me wonder like how many times have i purposely intentionally just not listened to god sure hope at times still <laughs> anyways go ahead vicky and as brandon brought up that point what rested in my spirit is actually rahab because jesus himself when when after jesus was resurrected and thomas came and asked him to show me your hand right there's a there's a verse that that jesus says um at least you can see but blessed is those who do not see and believe Mm -hmm. and as brandon is raising that point about these people knowing that he has the capacity to heal the blind because they've seen it yet they still doubting it really Mm -hmm. highlights the faith of Rahab because she didn't see it she didn't see it yet she was still able to so powerfully declare the ability of God and choose a side you know what I mean and these people are living the miracle yet they still (laughs) put boundaries on the ability of God and and as Brandon was talking I was just like darn and as you were mentioning Julie how many times have we put limits on Mm -hmm. God you know, so yeah, that's pretty. It it just makes her doper in my mind. <laughs> Is right. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. All right, here, Joshua. Welcome. So we're in chapter eleven, same way. Realize that we actually stopped earlier up, so we just looked at verses thirty to thirty-seven. I believe we're about to move on. In case if anybody else have anything else to say, Joshua, you saying something? No, I mean, I thought I ended at 44, but okay. No, no worries in going over some. Yeah, anything. 
I think we ran up to 44, but we didn't comment up to 44. Yeah, I think that was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, any more comments? We can continue. All right. Verses 38 to 46. Yeah, I think I'm going to this in one jump. All right. Jesus, therefore, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, If you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that thou didst send me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many therefore of the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what he had done, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. All right, guys, let's break this down. First thing that came to your mind. Like, the first thing that came to my mind is, like, <laughs> what more than people are you want to see? Because you raise somebody from a dead dog, like, <laughs> what else do you want me to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. What's yeah. And what else? For me. I oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just, um, when I think about, oh, in previously when we had said that mm-hmm. even the whole, the whole about, sorry, I'm very tired, but basically how one of the sisters stayed back, forget their name right now, they stayed back and how in them staying back, when they finally left, it brought people, she brought people with her because they were coming for another reason, but it still ended up that they were in they were able to witness a miracle. I think it was just it was just goes to show how far ahead God was thinking when yeah. even in the iniquities of her, you know, not wanting to see Jesus because why well, you really do me away, Jesus, you could have come and save him and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Jesus, God was already looking beyond that to say, these people are gonna gather. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it's, I just I found that really impressive. Yeah, there's no coincidence when it comes to God. Thanks, Joshua. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, Brandon. Yeah. Um, two points. Verse thirty-nine. Bear in mind that it's Mary and Martha are the ones that called Jesus to come and do something about the situation, right? Of their brother being mm-hmm. sick. And now Jesus is here and instructing them to take away the stone. And guess who is now presenting herself as an obstruction to Jesus during that work? The same person who invited Jesus into the situation. She says, um, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. And I find that wild. You invited Jesus to help in your situation, and he's prepared to act in your situation. But because it wasn't the way that you envisioned, now you're presenting an obstruction to him doing so. Which in my mind is like five thumps in the face because it's just crazy. like, wow, that's that's crazy. And mm-hmm. we've discussed it here before, I think, when we were looking at the, the story of the lame man by the pool of Bethesda. Sometimes we want Jesus to act in our situation, but we have a predetermined way of how he must act. So much so that when he's ready to act, we are we sidestep and we are unwilling for him to do 
what he ultimately wants to do in our lives for our good and his glory. Imagine Martha getting in the way, Mary, yeah, Martha getting in the way of Jesus performing this powerful miracle. And that's why I think when we pray, it requires uh, this principle of submission where it's willing to allow God to do what he sees best in your life, regardless of what you think is best at the time. And mind you, that may be uncomfortable because for Martha, that required her brother going through the sadness of her brother being dead for four whole days. That's That hurts. That's hard to, to go through the death of somebody you love dearly. So she had to be dealing with that. But then here comes Jesus now, ready to work in a way that she hadn't had planned. And I praise God that despite her her initial objection, God was still able to work powerfully in her life. But definitely this part of the story teaches me true submission to what God, whatever God wants to do in my life, even if it may be uncomfortable, I know he's doing it for my good and for his glory. Not just my good, but for the good of others, those around me as well, those around me. The second point I wanted to make was the fact that Jesus left no room for anybody to question the legitimacy of his miracle. He waited four days for this man to be dead. So nobody could say, as we were discussing earlier, the Jewish perspective on the three days and the spirit and all of them things there. But he left no room for them to think like, all right, was he actually dead? Nah, he's been in the grave for four days to the extent where no stink. That's how long he's been there. When Jesus comes there, he doesn't even go straight to the grave. He asked to be brought to the grave so that nobody could set any kind of fishing business go on. And then when he gets to the grave, he asks somebody else to remove the stone. So at no point does he have any interaction with Lazarus or any interaction with the scenario before he steps in. He leaves it like a closed case to the fact that he did this by the power of God. And it, it's interesting that, you know, throughout the story, we had to require some sadness, unfortunately. But despite the sadness that was experienced by Martha and Mary, God was able to, to keep everything so tight and so in such a unique fashion that absolutely nobody could question the legitimacy of his power. And because Mary and Martha had availed themselves to Jesus acting in the situation, they were able to see him demonstrate that power in such a magnanimous way. And I praise God for that. Amen. Amen. That was a word right there. Go ahead, Joshua. Honestly, um, I mean, starting off with a point about Jesus saying, did I tell you not? Tell you if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Now, we talk about submission, or we talk about getting in God's way. But when I read this, I don't really see Martha particularly submitting. Like, she doesn't give a counter dialogue, I guess we could say. But I guess what I'm getting at is the part about getting in God's way. I'm very grateful because you ever talk to God about something that is so... Like, let's say you're a hothead or something, you know, and you say, God, you want to, I want to receive this position of leadership. But you, for me, like, oh, I, I need to, my, my, I obviously I need to become a better person. But every time I might lose my temper or, or not necessarily get, but, but think poorly or negatively about a situation, I start to doubt if I'm actually, if I can ever become that person that I feel like I should, I, I'm being called to be like this better version. I don't think this miracle can be worked in my life because of my sin, so to speak. And I'm really grateful when he says, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me because it's instances like these that make me remember that. Yes, I'm called to really become that greater person, but that's not on my own. It's with God. And we had discussed this before where, where we were saying, you know, when we're breaking down Jehovah Jireh, where although we do let down Jesus, like I'm not saying I'm going to keep sinning and then everything's going to work out. But there's that element of when I am frail because I do fail, it's not dependent on me. Like my, like I stumble, I'm like, all right, I hate that. 
whenever I go get this, I think that's quite comforting for me at least. And, and sometimes I have a hard time even believing that. But when I do believe that there's still hope because it's not just me in it, I feel very encouraged. And I'm grateful for a situation like this where, like genuinely, I don't think they were believing. And God had the intentions of working this miracle in their life. And so it did happen. So, yeah. Mm, thanks, Joshua. Thanks. It's crazy how I feel like sometimes we tell ourselves or we trick ourselves into thinking that you know we're allowing God to take full control over a situation, or we believe that God can do something. You know, just as Brandon said, you know, if He didn't do it in a particular way, you know, the way that we envisioned it, immediately we start doubting God, as if we can understand his ways as if our thoughts are like his thoughts you know it's wow it's so crazy when you're reading the bible and you're just reading stories of yourself <laughs> well thank god for his grace and his mercy all right anybody else yes go ahead vicky <laughs> so the, this part man Trust me, like when I become a preacher, I'm still going to preach a whole sermon about this. Like I love this passage so much. There's so many things you can you can draw from from it. I think I shared in this group already about the stinkest part, how that had hit me personally, because whenever I feel like I I I sin, I feel stink within myself. And just the fact that they said, you know, by no. They he stink it is almost like this idea that people have given up on you, and then Jesus is kind of the one that steps in and said, No, no you roll away the stone. You hear what I say, roll away the stone, and calls me to come forth. And I come forth bound and I come forth stink and I come forth dirty. But the whole point is to come forth and let Jesus um deal with it, you know. And one of the most powerful things in this to me is when Jesus said, Loose him you know lose him and i think that's so powerful because i think jesus jesus does that with us you know like he's on a daily basis he's he's advocating on our behalf when everybody else thinks we're dead and gone and we're done with and we stink and we tie up and all of these things jesus is there saying come forth and lose him you know but apart from that no what came to me today as we were reading was when Jesus said, when Jesus prayed, and he said, um, I know that though, I thank thee that thou heard me, that thou hast heard me. This is 41. And then he goes on to say, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And then when he said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus come forth and I never like took this part in before until we were reading it just now and I'm just like what does that mean like what can we draw from that you know and what hit me like I'm not sure how anybody else how it resonates with anybody else but what hit me was just like how we're discussing belief right we talk about believing in god how mary and martha seem to be doubting or not doubting and all of these things what i drew from this is that jesus trusts that god hears him right and he doesn't need of course we know this he doesn't need to do it for anybody else to see because he already knows what god has in store for him what god can do through him he understands his power from he was a child when he was 12 and he went into the temple and he said you don't you know i need to be about my father's business like jesus understands his power and his connection to god and so on and i'm wondering like how many of us can can achieve this you know what I mean? Like, I'll use myself, for example. I know what God has put in me. I doubt it a lot of times, but me know. And he, I, I, I love God so much because 
he cares so much that he sends me reminders when I need them most. He sends me these crazy reminders that I need when I need them most to say, there's a word over your life. Don't ever doubt that word over your life. You might not see where it's manifesting right now, but don't ever doubt that word. And I don't need to boast about that word. And sometimes I, I feel when people look down on me and I feel a way about it because I'm just like, you have no idea the seed that has been planted in me. You know them where they, but I, I have nothing to show for it. Like I really don't have nothing to show for it. I don't have the money to show for it. I don't have the life to show for it. But it's just me and God and I trust God with this. I trust God with the future he has shown me. You know what I mean? And ladies and gentlemen, it's rough because sometimes I struggle, me not lie. Like sometimes I struggle financially, sometimes I struggle sin wise, sometimes I struggle with just faith, sometimes I struggle. I don't walk away and I don't let go because there's a piece of me, there's this quiet voice inside me that says, you know, he trusts God, he's going to come true. And sometimes I'm wondering if I'm schizophrenic. And I didn't hear God's voice. It's just me, you know? And then out of the blue, God sends a reminder from some stranger somewhere. And I know it's real. But I can't walk up and down. I can't, I can't sign a contract based on, on what God tells me, don't it? I have to. It's like nobody else is going to believe me. But it really comes down to, do I believe it? I hope I don't sound like me not saying. <laughs> but I wonder if you get what I'm saying. Like, do we believe what God says to us? Do we believe in who God is to us privately, where you have nothing to show for it, but you can trust it? You can trust what God has done for you. When the people then want to attack you and, and, and say, Oh, you're a Christian and you're this and you're that and you're this. But you know, me not have a, in an argument with you over it, but me know. And that's what resonates with me in these two Bible verses right here when Jesus said, I know that you hear me and I know you will always hear me and I thank you that you hear me. But it's just for other people in this scenario why I'm not going to say it out loud. Like, do we, can we have that level of trust and relationship with God? Can we ever? But yeah, I'm going I'm to shut up now. <laughs> no, man, I appreciate that, you know, a lot. Like, it really, like, it really resonated with me. I think the only thing that I think is nice about that is that you say is people looking down on you. Personally, nobody look down on me more than myself. And it's something I'm still, like, it's like I'm aware of it. People be saying, Joshua, you know, look up more. And it's just like I'm very critical. And I and I don't wanna I in the past I've been very critical. I should so I so I should speak. But yeah, it's just like everything we just said applied to me, except that me as the same person that's so critical about myself. But I appreciate that, man. It's really that. When, it, when last two weeks ago, I think, when I came, when I just started the John 11, or was it two weeks ago? I don't even know. But the idea of being so in line with God that, you know, there's not a moment of doubt is kind of what you're alluding to. And I tell you, man, for a, for a moment until myself to slip up and start doubt again, but for a moment when I really lived in that space, where I am in line with God. And I'm aware that I'm in line with God. I'm not questioning it. And that was a different, I'm always going to be pursuing that. And when I'm in it, I'm going to try to maintain it because it was truly powerful, as you say. Thanks for sharing, guys. And you know, Vicky, while you were speaking, it came to me like, well, you do have something to show for it, though. Like, all those testimonies that you're always coming and telling us, you know, your life, you do have a lot to show for the blessings. Miss Anna, you started this meeting by saying, you know, this was the first year that 
you didn't have like a stable job or the way God came through for you and how you did things that you never thought you would do. That is what you can show for it, Vicky. You have a whole heap to show. But also at the same time, you know, like while you were speaking, it's like you were speaking to Julie from two years ago, where I felt like if people didn't understand or if people didn't see this change, then it wasn't valid enough. You know, like I realized I was getting my validation from people more than from God. And that's not how it should be. It's so easy because we already know that God says this over our lives, you know, and we know that it's true. But man, it can be hard when you're living this new life, but people are still telling you that you're still a person from your past. It's hard. It's really hard to like tone out all those voices. But that's why it's so important to tone tune in into God's voice every day, daily, you know, minute by minute. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying, Vicky. I I totally get you, bro. I get you what I'm saying. Yeah. Right, well, thanks for sharing that, Vicky. And you asked yeah, if... Is somebody trying to get in, Julie? Somebody just sent me a message that they're trying to get in. And it's the same thing happened to me last week. Oh, what have you asked, Rav? Hey, Matthew. What are you hey, Matthew. <laughs> I want to that, Julie. All right. So, mm -hmm. Of course, we've always spoken. And thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, of course, we've always spoken in this group about how God gives us a check that we can't. Our immediate life never looks like we can't cash. Y'all ever feel that way? Like, you know, say, God put on something in front of your ways, just like, Lord, I don't see how you're going to do this. You know them way there? And yes. that's what my life is like. It's not like at the level I'm at now, I appreciate it 100%, 100%. And I know that it's it's growing levels, you know? But Julia can promise you that the the vision God has given me for my life is nowhere near this. And it's like you almost feel like you want it. No, you know, why me can't be that person tomorrow? Or why me can't be that person? No. And I can give you an example when I came back from the States with my nice, nice masters and everything. I thought this was when the vision was gonna come true. You know what I mean? So I started applying to the places where I saw myself working and they started rejecting me. Like, you know, though your qualifications are, are impressive, um, we decided to go in a different direction or, you know, we don't have a post for you at this time. Or, and after a while it began to hurt. Because, and, and then I'm like, Lord, if I never for you, I wouldn't even have this vision of myself. You know what I mean? You wouldn't have this level of ambition for yourself because me, me good with just juggling day by day and just get a little job and that's who I used to be. You know, that me just good with just making, taking it a day at a time and just whatever dropping on me lot, me take it. But no, it's like God put something in my spirit, in my soul, where it's almost like me can't shake it and it's just like, when, that, when, when am I going to be that person? You know, and it's almost like, like I said, it is it, it's just between you and God. You have to trust that vision because when the bills them to pay at the end of the month, and yes, me not short or nothing, me, me pay me bills them, but there's nothing left over for me to buy myself one nice pair of shoes. Not complaining none at all, but I'm like, you know, sometimes you look upon that and say, boy, sometimes when you pay the bills and you you juggle. A little tear drop because me have to literally I ship up things to make sure it's a disability pay and disability pay. You know what I mean? And I and I have to hold on to the the fact that Lord me know say I have better in store for me. Me know the vision you have. So so it's not that me doubt God. Me, as me say me test me can testify every day of how God come true for me. But when God gives you like a vision of the future, like for example a, a family. You know what I mean? Like the other day I went to a, a women's meeting and the girl said to me, say, I see marriage over you. 
And I could have tell her, I said, me see it over myself too. Me see it over myself from my picnic. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm about to be 36 and it don't come true yet. I know I have other people telling me, it, it look like so Vicky no plan for have kids. I ne ne ever got have kids. But me have to be the one for hold on to that. That's between me and God. Because me knows that God tell me. That's in your future. You know? But when you see you turn 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. And you have had the surgery. And you have had the this. And you, you begin to doubt. Is this ever going to happen for me? Then that's when you have to hold on to that private conversation you and God have you know what I mean and 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 hold on to what Jesus says the Lord I know that you hear me and I know that you always hear me but in he, in this case he did it for other people but I'm saying that it's not always that shows that it's not always Jesus do it for other people and for me it's like how many times do we walk like that how many times do we walk? Me not argue with people when them say things like, you're not going to have kids. Me not argue with them because me know the conversation me and God have. You understand? Me know what God, what God put in my heart about kids and marriage and all of that. But how do you prove that, Julie, to anybody? So the question becomes, do we need to prove that? Do we need to prove that? You know, I don't need to prove it. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie, there's a little doubt. There's a little fear. There's a little, you know, like, really, God, did you really show me this? Or it not come true. It was just my own dream and my own desire, but it's not, it's not your will. And then out of nowhere, he sends somebody like you, Julie, to speak over me and remind me. And then you would you don't even know say I confirm something over me. You know what I mean? So it's not that I doubt what God is doing for me now, but it's like what He has shown me for my future. Sometimes I'm just like, you I have to be the one to sit down with it. You know what I mean? Because I cannot prove that to anybody. How do I tell somebody say God tell me to make a half kids? You know, how do you tell somebody that? They probably think my mad, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, everybody. Vicky, real time, you know, my figure, it's like what you're talking about that Julie's having had for you is what you're having over my life, right? And I really appreciate that. And the term that you said about, it's, it's an uncashable check. That's so, I, Julie and I, she, like I just had to finally pay down on a place for rent. And when you say uncashable check, I'm just it just made me realize that the check isn't uncashable, you know, is that it does have a timestamp and it can't catch up before that, even though why would a good for cash it all right now, you know. So it's a September first, and it's September first. So Alpha August 30, and then August 31st is just like it now go happen until then. And sometimes because we can't see the date, like sometimes I don't know what the date is, then it starts to get really, really you know, despondent, but the check is there and we have a check in my hand, which is that promise that we have with God. It's just that he never gave me the full details from the bank draft. But yeah, honestly, appreciate that. Advocate. Before you go, Brandon, I just wanted to make it clear, because I was agreeing with you, you know, I was in complete agreement with you. I was just saying that sometimes we can't prove it to other people and that's okay. Because you know the word that God gave to you, you know, and that's just as you said, that's you and God. Oh yeah, I was agreeing with you, sis. I was completely agreeing. I know with you. you're agreeing with me, miss. I know. I was just trying to explain it better. <laughs> but no, I totally agree with me, babe. And trust me, a lot of times, Julie, you mm. have no idea how many times you your settings we won't even know put my heart at ease when I'm going through like one of those periods you know what I mean you know because you out of the blue sent me stuff and I'm like Julie I have no idea where you just do you know how God just used you Brandon has done that for me as well but just out of the blue we just send something or say something in Bible study and I'm just like dude you have no idea how God just used you for confirm something in my spirit or just soothe my soul right now because I do have those moments I have those moments when my question say, God did you really show me a check like Joshua say like mm -hmm. it, I know it not going cash now but 
did I really see a check or this is just a figment of my imagination? You know what I mean? But yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I completely get that, Ricky. There are times when you know God's promises, but at the same time, boy, in the waiting, I always say this, in the waiting is when it's the hardest. Oh yeah, God, hold on to this. God's promises will come through for you, and I look forward to seeing these promises come through. All right, Brandon can go ahead. Yeah, this this conversation is beyond powerful. And what you were saying a while ago, Julie, is in line with the point that I wanted to make. This idea of waiting, it isn't easy at all. But then even as I, I thought about it and Bible stories that helped me to understand it even better, it's in the midst of waiting, the goodness of God can seem very confusing. And it's hard to decipher how God can be good in that waiting period. For Mary and Martha, their waiting period required their brother to die. That's hard, you know? It's it's hard to, to see the goodness of God when during that waiting period, you don't see the fulfillment of the promises that you believe are true. And one of the stories that brings that to mind for me is the story of Abraham or Abraham at the time and his wife, Sarah. You know, God had clearly told them that, hey, y'all are going to have a son years upon years upon years of waiting god tell abraham and wife that they're going to have a child you know and that period of waiting i can imagine must have been exhausting to the extent where sarah had so much given up on it that when the angels came to their house to reconfirm the promise sarah laughed so i was like can we kind of just like shut down the story now and move on with our lives and I imagine so many times in the midst of our waiting for the miracle that we believe to be true, sometimes it's possible to possible to become despondent and possible to, you know, lose sight of the, the promises of God. And like Sarah and, and Abraham, sometimes we take those matters into our own hand. But in the midst of that waiting, I see God being doubly good, if that makes sense. Not only is God seeking us to bless us with the miracle that he had promised, but in that midst of that waiting, he seeks to bless us as well, which I think is such a, a, a powerful thing for God to do. He blesses you not just with the end result of the process, but he blesses you with the process as well. There is the story um, of the Israelites in Babylonian captivity, a verse of scripture that everybody loved to claim of Jeremiah 29 verse 11 that says, you know, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give an expected end. God gave that promise to the Israelites while they were in the midst of their, what was it, 70-year um, captivity in Babylon. In the midst of their waiting period, they had to be reminded of the promises of God. And sometimes, as I said, in the waiting period, it's, it's maybe difficult to see the goodness of God being expressed in that. But one thing that God has definitely proven in my life is that the blessing of that waiting period can't be gained through any other experience as hard as waiting is it's necessary a necessary blessing that we have to receive and let me tell you why um when we read the book of galatians one of the fruits of the spirit is long suffering otherwise called patience that is not something that we can experience without having our moments with god in other words waiting for the final result of the blessing sets the platform for us to receive the blessing of the fruit of the spirit. And I said, God, I don't see how anybody else could have matched this out except you. And so even though the waiting for the four days, you know, and you call Jesus and waiting to see the fulfillment of his process, his promises may be hard. We can be certain in the story, um, through the story of Abraham and Sarah, through the story of Israel in Babylonian captivity, through the story of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, that that waiting period is a blessing and at the end of it, he can say, I do this for the glory of my father and for the good of all those present. And I say, Jesus, big up yourself because you see better than I do. And I thank you that you do what you do, even though my brain sometimes doesn't really connect the dots like you do. Amen. Amen. I absolutely love that, Brandon. You're saying something, Vicky? Yo, that was so good. <laughs> that was so good. I can testify to that. Like, 
I can tell you, I reached a point where I was so frustrated and I came to Bible study and I put a, a prayer request in. And that prayer request was out of frustration. And Daniel was assigned to pray for me. And Daniel prayed a prayer. And I'll never forget. Instead of praying over my prayer request, Daniel prayed a totally different prayer for me. And in that prayer, Daniel said, Lord, may she understand the season that she's in and may she embrace the season. And he lit me for six. And when I, we came off Bible study, I prayed that same prayer over myself. Lord, help me to embrace this season and just understand why you're putting me through this. What is this wait? Embrace the waiting. And just like Brandon said, it has been a blessing. I can tell you, this has been one of the roughest seasons of my life, but it has been one of the most rewarding. I have a testimony I can give you every month. And you see, just like the story of the woman with the oil, who decides to them just to go use the last oil? And no, not that one. The, the one that said that she was going to use her last flour and bake it and die. And then you have the one with the oil that said she just have one bottle of oil and no care how she had poured the oil can done. That is literacy, literally my testimony right now. Every month when I think I am down to my last, and I don't know how next month I go. go. Me, me can tell you not one time has my bank account been empty. Not one time. Not one time has the gas in my car ever run low. Not one time has God me ever shocked upon whatever. My student loan is 500 US dollars per month and not one month. Me don't have that full $500 to pay. Not one month. I can promise you. And just like Brandon said, Every day, God shows up for me. Every day. And it's amazing. And I'm so grateful because I don't do nothing to deserve it. I don't do nothing special. You understand? And I'm just like, I stink, Lord. And you don't give up on me. You don't give up on me. You call me forth out of the grave every day. And you provide for me every day. And that's why I have to be like, yo, big up yourself, God, just like Brandon. Big up yourself any day. Glory to God. I got goose pimples a while ago. God is faithful, man. God is so faithful. Thanks for sharing that with us, Vicky. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, this moments like these make me really even more grateful for this community that we have, that for this family that we share, for us to be able to be there for each other like this, you know, for God to just bind us together with his love and his promises like this. <clears throat> All right. Anybody else have anything you'd like to say? All right. Um, I already said hi to Matthew. Welcome, Lexi. Um, we we're looking at John chapter 11, and we we're just looking at verses 38 to 46, where Jesus calls Lazarus, Lazarus out of the tomb. So yeah, um, any more comments on those verses before we continue? I feel like we can continue, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, would anyone like to take over from me from reading by any chance? Yeah, man. It's in here. All right. Thanks, Joshua. All right. So we're going to wrap up chapter 11 now. So verses 47 to 57, please. All right. Um, 47. The chief priests. Is it 47, right? Yeah, man, 47. Mm -hmm. Then the chief priest and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. 
here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Cephas, Cephas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he, called, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was about time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? For the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Amen. Thank you, Joshua. All right. Any comments, guys? Man, um, I just like the, I want, see, when the high priest prophesied that Jesus would die for the nations, right? Sometimes when it said scattered children of God, it's just like, for me, I'm just like, I'm one of those scattered children, right? But a little part of me becomes, and this might be a completely different topic, but a little part of me becomes a bit remorseful because it's just like God says, God would want all, all people to come to him. I, I, I'm butchering the verse, but then scattered seems like we're still, like it's selective because, or maybe I'm interpreting it, so somebody can deny me, but whenever I think scattered, it's like you're scattered amongst other things. Are scattered away from the, the or like where you're supposed to be. So I think about those that you know will truly never really know God. Um and I just I don't know what to think about that. If someone can like me, I know it's it might be a whole different topic, but yeah. That's interesting, Joshua. Class, what do you say? Any any comments for Joshua? Anybody? Can you repeat the question? It was more it was less, of a, less of a question and more of a a, a hurt in inside. It's just like when I when I interpret the word scattered children, the first thing that comes to me is scattered amongst. I mean, it could also be thinking scattered afar, meaning that it's just everybody. When I think scattered, the first thing I think is scattered amongst other things. So you have to go and search for them. And whenever I think about that, it's just like, can you imagine if I never know God? That's how I feel about a lot of other people. And I feel so strongly about God. And I know that they feel strongly about whatever else they want to believe in. And that just makes me, you know, I don't want to take away from what we were going with the everything that we've been talking about, but it just made me feel so sad. Like, I don't know, how, I know, I don't know how to feel. Well, I'm just sure you can like pray about it and, you know, hope God reveals some answers to to these feelings that you're feeling right now. Sorry about it, guys, but it's just like, can you imagine if I wasn't, even if I didn't give my life to the Lord? 
Uh, it's alright. I mean, yeah, it's, I don't want to spoil, but I think about these other people who, for whatever reason, have been caught up in something else, and they just they have denied themselves, or something has denied themselves what we can experience here. I didn't want it, it genuinely meant more to cry for them because it's just like it's like I don't know what to do or how to feel about it. But yeah, that's all. We can do. Well, you can pray, bro. You can pray for the salvation. I pray, no. And it's something I've been praying for since my from since I gave my life to God. It's something that I've always been aware of. But it's just like, you know, I see people, some people pass away, and I know that, you know, they didn't accept Jesus. And I and I know that even for me, sometimes I, it's just like, I pray, Lord, save every, every soul. But, and a part of me believes, but another part of me is just like, that's probably not God's intention, but then I remember, I can't remember the verse, but it's like, it's, um, it, it says something like, oh man, I'm butchering, but almost like it's for God, God's desire is for all of us to come to him. And then I'm just like, I'm not seeing that happen. And it just, I don't know. Yeah, it's like, not my desire that any should perish, something like that. It, yeah, I know which verse yes, that's exactly. That's that's what I'm talking about. And then I look to it, and I look at the world. I look at like I have to. I I can't keep berating myself because I know that I'm God. But then I look at the world, and I'm just like I'm so fortunate that I was able to be introduced and choose God. And how I feel, I think other people feel that way with not God. And then, as you said, it's not God's desire, but then it happens and. It, it's just like the uh, second Peter verse 9. But yeah, I will continue to pray for it. It's a side thing that whenever I feel grateful, it also brings a little bit of courage in front of me. It's just like, man, I'm grateful that I am, but what about the rest of us? So I, just, I guess we have to all give thanks that we're here. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I do understand what you're saying, bro, Joshua. You know, it hits different when you're actually in this love that has no explanation, you know. This love that, this beautiful place to be with God. And then you see other people out there who haven't given up the life of sin to experience this love as well. I know how hard that is. Trust me, there are times that I'm walking on campus and the thought that, wow, so many of the Chinese people around me don't even know who God is. And it's like, how do they even live? Like, I can't imagine a life without God. So I do understand this sadness that you're feeling, Joshua. But as I said, you know, just keep praying, bro. Keep praying. All right, guys, anybody else? Welcome, Markela. We're at John chapter 11, and we're looking at verses 47 to 57. Okay, anybody else? Any more comments, guys? Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, if there's anything that these latter verses of this chapter prove to me is the importance of knowing God for yourself and not being hyper dependent on the church space to be the channel through which you understand God. Because when you look at these verses, the church leaders of the day were the people who wanted to kill Jesus. They were the people antagonistic to God. And therefore, if I was a Jew living in that day and my experience with God was simply defined by what the the church leaders of that day said then i'd be lost and so i think it's it's crucial for every single person who identifies with the name christian to discover god for themselves there is beautiful importance in in the church space and the church community but it should never be the extent to which all right my understanding of god and bible is simply dependent on what the pastor man says well, how has God revealed himself to me through his word and through my experiences? Um, and I think it's crucial that we understand that. And the more that we fall in love with Jesus and understand him through the word, then 
you know, even as, as Earth's history comes to a close and, and scripture speaks of deceptions that will take place, you know, when I'm founded on the word of God and founded on the truth of his word, then I can stand fast despite the deceptions that may be going around the world. And so just a reminder for all of us to hold on to our Bibles and hold on to Jesus, not just through our parents, not just through a church leader or a church aunt or church uncle, as important as they are, but to hold on to Jesus for ourselves. Amen. Retweet. Definitely. So, so crucial. Oh my gosh, so crucial for us to know God for ourselves. Thanks, Brandon. All right. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Alrighty, I'm gonna give my two cents. So let's look at verse 48. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So more than likely, the religious leaders thought of the temple as their place. They had made such an idol of the temple that they were willing to kill Jesus to preserve it. It is telling that the religious leaders thought of the temple as our place, quote unquote, guys, <laughs> as our place, as if it belonged to them. And many church leaders today do the same, truly thinking of the church as our church, air quotes again, instead of really understanding that it belongs to Jesus. Any comments on that? Should I continue? All right, I'm going to continue. You can also look at verse 51. Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. So Caiaphas gave an unconscious and involuntary prophecy. John was careful to give the credit to the office, not to the man, meaning that because he was high priest and not because of him, himself okay wholesome and there's this quote to just like you know really drive that through wholesome sugar may be found in a poisoned cane a precious stone in a toad's head a flaming torch in a blind man's hand you know so in spite of how someone may be like their nature God is so powerful that God can use them just the same for his glory. All right. And then the last verses that we're looking at, verses 53 and 54, right? Okay. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. And Jesus, therefore, no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Um, many times we've seen throughout the book of John where, you know, Jesus didn't walk publicly, but that's because his time had not yet come. It wasn't an uh, out of fear thing that he was hiding. And we can see this in John chapter 7, verse 13. All right, guys, so any more comments so that we can fully finish off chapter 11? No, we're really quiet now. All right. Um, what do you guys want to do? We can continue into chapter 12. Or would you guys prefer to wrap up right here? I know it's a bit early, but you know, since we're going into a new chapter. Is that I guess want to continue? I'm cool with that. Or you want to wrap up right here? The decision is serious. So you're all going to have to talk to me. Second, I need to look at the next chapter. Uh, all right. I prefer to wrap up. All right, two oh, yeah, more. All right, so we're going to wrap up yeah. right here then. All right, guys. Well, we just wrapped up John 11. Yay. This was such a wonderful Bible study. This was so great. Thanks, guys. All right. So, um, as usual, um, Brandon, how many prayers do we need this week? 
we have three prayer requests. I don't know if anybody else would like to add theirs, but the link was just sent in the, the chat, the Google Meet chat. So you can drop a prayer request real quick and I'll add them to the list. But as of now, we only have three prayer requests. All right. So if you haven't as yet, just quick and fast add your prayer request, guys. In the meantime, can I have two volunteers, someone to sing a prayer for us? And for now, we just one person to pray. Thank you, Joshua. All right, and one person to pray, please. Anybody? Hey, before it continues, anybody else adding any prayer requests right now? I'm sending it out to some of my friends that couldn't attend to see if they want to add anything, but tentatively, I think this is it. Yeah, I feel like this is it. <laughs> All right, Brandon, you can just share the screen with that then. And still waiting on a volunteer to pray. Hey, Markela. Okay. So, um, Brandon, you can just add that to the list as well for Markela. Wait, Brandon gone? Oh, okay. Working for is still here. Cool. So, Joshua had asked to add a prayer of thanks and Markela a prayer for focus. I said that not because I didn't want to go and fill it to myself, but two of those prayers are coming to mind. So I didn't want to add a third one. That's so I just said prayer, prayer, thanks. All right. Can I share your screen in the meantime, Brandon, when you're ready? All right. Thank you. Since we don't have any volunteers, then I'll pray. So Joshua, you can go ahead and sing a prayer for us, and then I'll pray after you. Temples built with hands, made with precious stones, but all along you wanted to make us your treasured home. Mansions made for man, you touched the sky from earth, but still your house of choice was broken, vessels made of dirt, so make my heart your home. Oh, mm -hmm. All that's mine is yours, mm -mm -mm -mm. please make my heart your home. Mm -hmm. All that's mine is yours. Dun, 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 dun. What about the mess in me? He was born in a manger. What if I'm unclean? He'll make you new. That's what you'll do. What if I'm fallen? He'll open up. Oh, let go. He's knocking on the door of your heart. Oh, let him in. Let him in. So make my heart your home. Oh, mm -hmm. all that's mine is yours. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Please make my heart your home. Mm -hmm. All that's mine is yours. Mm, 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 mm. Amen, amen. Thank you, Joshua. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, my friend or a friend, what a privilege it is to be able to talk to you like this. You know, not having to go to any far distance or having to do any ritual before. But we can just stop where we are right now and just talk to you as our friend, as our father, as our king. Thank you for who you are, God. Thank you that who you are never changes, 
that you are who you are and it's a beautiful thing it's a wonderful thing we give you praise and all the honor and all the glory for that father thank you god for this bible study that has just been so heart touching god i pray that we, none of us will leave this place the same i pray lord that the words that were said today that they will have a way in our hearts and in our minds or if there's any sort of um, stone in our hearts right now, God. I pray that those that, that heart of stone will be removed and be replaced with a heart of flesh, God. Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to live a life that's more pleasing to you, God. So I pray that if there's anything in our lives right now that is preventing us from truly walking in the way that you want us to, I pray, Lord, that you remove it. Help us to truly turn away from that life, God and to just walk towards you so that at the end of the day we can hear you say well done my good and faithful servant i have to start with joshua's prayer request for a uh, prayer of thanksgiving and i'm going to extend that prayer request as a prayer for all of us god you have been so faithful to us you have been so good to us god you have come through in ways that we never thought was possible. God, thank you for all the battles that you have fought on our behalf that we didn't even know about. Thank you for all the prayers that you have answered for us, especially the prayers, God, that you answered differently from what we expected. Thank you, Lord, for protecting us from ourselves. Thank you for providing for us, God. Thank you that we can truly call you our Father a father who gives and loves his children. Thank you for reminding us every day, God, that you you love us and that you want to extend, to, to really express that love to us, God. I pray that you remind us on the days that we forget to be thankful, for the days that our minds are so focused on the things that aren't going the way we want it to, that you are so good even during that time that even in the darkness, God, that you are still good and that will never change. I pray, God, that Joshua will re-experience you in a new way, in a refreshing way, God. I pray that you will show up in his life like a breath of fresh air, like spring breeze, God. I pray that you will open his eyes and remind him of the things that he probably forgot earlier on, that he knew earlier on in his Christian journey, God, because so often we forget these beautiful things that you have shown to us. So I pray, Lord, that you remind Joshua of these things. And for the things that he's yet to experience, God, I pray that in your beautiful way that he will experience that. that he will see you in everything that he does. And that he will be in such awe, God, that he will want to share that with, with everyone around him. God, you see his heart and how sudden he feels for those who don't know you the way he knows you god so i pray that you use joshua to to evangelize the people to bring people to you lord i know that you can do that in a powerful way and i look forward to seeing all the lives that are saved through joshua lord as well as saved through the rest of us here god lord still on joshua he's praying for forgiveness he is coming with a repentant heart, he and his friend. I pray, Lord, that you will cleanse Joshua and his friend's heart, cleanse all the, the, the dirtiness and the ugliness that may be in them, Lord. If it's that it's a, a cycle of sin, God, I pray that that chain will be broken right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that his life and his friend's life, God, will be a light for you that they will be the salt of this earth god i pray that you will help them on this journey you've already said in your word or that you there is no temptation that you have never um provided an escape for us god you just for us to choose that escape so i pray lord that any time that there is any sort of temptation that joshua and his friend will count it joy and to practice that endurance lord so that they will be perfect and complete in you. And I pray, Lord, that they will always choose to escape, God. Because honestly, it's, it's never worth it. This thing that is only 
get it behind us for a couple seconds, a couple minutes, or what it really may be, God, is, is nothing compared to the eternal glory, the eternal life that we get with you. So I pray, Lord, that you will see Joshua and his friends repent and cry, that you remove this sin from them as far as the east is from the west, and you remind them, God, that this is not their identity, that the identity that you have for them is of a new creation, and we give you thanks for that, God. I pray that we will abide in you, Father. I pray that if there's anything in us, we're probably self-sabotaging, God, if there's anything that we're putting between you and us. I pray, Lord, that it will be removed right now, that we will fully abide in you and that you will abide in us, God. I pray, Lord, that we will decrease so that you may increase. I pray, God, that if there's anything that is dead within us right now, that you bring it back up to life. Remind us of the resurrection power that lives within us. Help us to walk in that power, God. Help us to, to truly say no to that life of sin. Whatever it is that may be causing us to sin, Lord, if it's our hands, if our eyes, or our ears, whatever it may be, pray, Lord, that we will cut it off and that we will truly, truly cling on to you, God. You are our best friend, the greatest love that we can ever experience. You are love, God. So I pray that you remind us that everything else in this world is not worth it, God. I also pray for Markela. She's asking for a prayer for focus. But I truly relate to this, this prayer. It's so easy to get distracted in this world. You know, I don't know about Markela, but I know for myself that so often my mind is full of all these distracting thoughts, God. And I pray that if that's the same case for Markela, that you remove all those distractions, that she have laser focus on you only, God. And pray, Lord, whatever it is that may be distracting her, if it's herself, if it's those around her, whatever it may be, God, I pray, Lord, that she will just drop off all of that and focus on you, focus on walking on that narrow road, God, that leads to you. I pray that if there is anything else in Markela's life that needs intervention right now, God, if it's not just focus, maybe it's is finances or maybe it's personal relationships, whatever the case is, God. I pray that you will intervene in a special way, in a beautiful way, in a way that is evident, God, that you are the one that is doing all of this in her life. And thank you, Father, for all these beautiful things that you'll be doing in Markela's life. I thank you for all these amazing things that you'll be doing in the life of the members of Work in Progress. And I pray, God, that this group will continue to bloom and to grow and to flourish for you, God. I pray that if there's any time that we put ourselves before you, that that will be killed right now, God. That flesh will be killed right now. It's where our mission, God, is to bring you glory, is to win people for you, God, is to walk in your truth. So help us on this journey, God. Help us to stay on this narrow path for you. We love you so much, God. You are so amazing and gosh, it's just so beautiful and wonderful to know you and to be known. I pray that you protect those who are under the, the hearing of my voice right now. Protect them you know, physically, spiritually, Lord, mentally. And help us to just fully abide in you in every way possible, God. We love you. We give you thanks. In the Son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining Bible study this week. It was truly a pleasure and a blessing. I look forward to us tackling John chapter 12. There's so many goodies in John chapter 12. So come on out, pre-read, get excited from now. And i see you guys next week. God bless you guys. Stay safe. And I love you so, 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 so much. Bye, guys. See you next week.